Stanford University. Okay, welcome to lecture eight, Stanford CS193P, a spring of 2020. I'm gonna to try to keep the slides short today so we can jump into another big demo, but I need to talk about conceptual stuff behind a couple of things we're gonna do in the demo, namely user defaults, which is a very lightweight persistent store that we're just gonna use for demo purposes. And then the main meaty topic of today, which is gestures, getting input from your user using their fingers, basically. So let's talk about this user defaults thing. Before I do that, I wanna talk about persistence in general. By persistence, I just mean they making things stick on your iOS device, even when you quit your app and restart it. And there's numerous ways to make data persist. You can put it in a file system. iOS yeah, basically is a Unix machine underneath it all, and it has a Unix file system. And you can certainly store things in the file system. I hope to cover that later in the quarter. You could put things in a SQL database or some other kind of database. iOS has an awesome framework called core data that essentially does an object oriented programming layer on top of a SQL database. Really fantastic. Don't think we're going to get to that this quarter, but I'd like to at least talk about it later in the quarter. Of course, we can store things in iCloud. That's a great way because it's shared between all of our devices. And in fact, there's an entire framework called CloudKit, which lets us do database operations essentially that get stored in the cloud. So that's a cool way. And there's many third party options as well. Different frameworks provided by third parties that do the same kind of thing. Network databases, places to store things, etc. But one of the simplest ways to store things is using something called user defaults. And you can think of it as sort of a persistent dictionary. It feels a lot like a dictionary that just sticks on disk. But it really should only be used in act when you're shipping your app. You probably only want to use user defaults for like user preferences, small little things. You don't want to use it for, to, for example, store your documents, which is what we're gonna do in our demo. It's kind of why I'm telling you about user defaults. So we need some lightweight way to store our documents. So we're gonna do it. But I mean, user defaults is, is valuable though for storing these lightweight things, but you're gonna see there's some quirkiness to it as well. Now user defaults is quite limited in the type of data it can store. This is not just a full database or a full dictionary. You can put any type you want in there. It's kind of an ancient API, I call it. It's been around a long time. It far predates Swift UI or even Swift. And its API is a little strange for those of you in this class who are now really used to functional programming. But if we kind of squint at this API, we can make it look eh, close enough to Swift and functional programming for it to kind of fit in. The data that's stored in a user defaults is called a property list. Now, a property list is not a protocol or a struct or <laughs> any tangible kind of thing from Swift, because this is all pre-Swift. A property list is really just a concept. It's an idea. And that idea is that it's any combination of strings, ints, bools, floating point numbers, like float or double, dates, datas, which are bags of bits, just arbitrary data, arrays, and dictionaries. So you put any combination of those together, like an array that it has dictionaries with strings as the keys and ints as the values. That would be a property list, kind of a goofy one, but that would be a property list because all the things in there are one of these things. So that's all we can store there. We can't store anything else. If you want to store anything else, you have to convert it into a property list somehow. Now, a really powerful way in Swift to convert an arbitrary struct into a property list is using this codable protocol. And I'm just going to put that off and show you that in the demo rather than having a bunch of slides about it. And you'll see pretty quickly how codable works. And it's a great way to turn a struct into a data. And of course, a data bag of bits is a property list. And so we can throw it in user defaults. And we'll see that all in the demo. Now, the, why is the API of user defaults weird? Well, because prominently in that API is a type in Swift, which we have not talked about intentionally, called any. So any is basically a type that means untyped. If something's of type any, it's like it doesn't really have a type. Well, Swift is a strongly typed language. It does not like any, okay? Any is not, it's antithetical to Swift. But it has this type any, 
just for backwards compatibility with things like user defaults. So we really don't want to have anything to do with any as Swift UI and Swift programmers in general. But we want to use user defaults, so we're going to try to ignore any in user defaults as API, which is a challenge, but you can kind of do it. And yet we still want to understand how to use user defaults. So let's dive in here. First thing you need to use user defaults is you need an instance of user defaults. All the methods and functions that you're going to use in user defaults are instance methods. So we do that usually by this static bar called standard on user defaults. Already kind of weird, right? So you say user defaults as standard, and you get this shared instance you can use in your entire app. Now you can make other instances, but this is 99% of the time how we do it. And then if we want to store data, we're going to use this function called set for key. And set takes the first argument there, which is object. That object has to be a property list. So it has to be an int or array of strings or something like that, something that has only those things we talked about that could be in a property list. But it can be anything as long as that's all that's in there. And then for key is just some random string. And again, this is like a dictionary. So this, that's like the key to look it up later. Now for convenience, there's also things like set double, which takes a double for key. That's syntactic sugar, really. It's no different than saying set with 37.5 for key is the same thing. But you can see how this looks like a dictionary, right? Setting values for a certain key. Now, how do I get the data back out? Well, really easy. There's a whole bunch of functions like integer for key, data for key, URL for key, even string array for key, where it will return, go look in user defaults at that key, see what anyone has stored there before. And if it's able to make it into the type you want, like a URL or a string array, it will return it. If not, it's going to return nil. So this is great if it's one of those kind of basic types. But what if you have an array of something besides strings? Well, it starts to get complicated, and this is where any starts to come out and a monster to get us. And so if I try to store an array of, let's say, dictionaries, that's legal, but there's no function called give me the array of dictionaries. There's only an array of string. That's the only array one there is. So if you call just array for key, you're going to get an array of any. And how do I deal with this any? Well, you're going to have to use this operator in Swift called as to typecast the things in the array from any's to being what type you hopefully know what they are. Uh, we're going to stop right here. I don't want to really talk about typecasting and all that. You really don't need to do that very much in Swift. Now, your reading assignment this week is going to talk about that. So if you want to know about this, you'll see the section called typecasting. It'll tell you all about it. And hopefully, though, you can just avoid this whole thing by somehow figuring out to use one of these normal ones from the top of the screen right here. And Codable might really help you there because you can use data for key. And Codable can help you turn almost any struct, even an array of some wacky thing, into a data. So that's all I'm going to say about user defaults for today. And we're going to get on to our main topic here, which is gesture. So gestures is really about getting input from the user. Uh, we call this multi-touch because, of course, you can put multiple fingers down at the same time and do gestures, and Swift UI will recognize them. Swift pretty much takes care of recognizing these gestures. When someone puts two fingers down and starts squeezing the fingers together, Swift recognizes, well, that's like a pinch. They're pinching. I know that gesture. So it recognizes them. All you have to do is say which views you want to recognize which things, and it'll start recognizing them. But it's not just recognizing them that matters. Once it recognizes that this pinch is happening, you and your code have to handle the gesture. So there's recognizing it. Swift does that. Swift UI does that. And then there's handling it, which is something you have to do. And handling it just means deciding what to do when there's a pinch or a drag or a tap. So let's talk first about how you make your views recognize that a certain gesture is happening using Swift UI's powerful gesture recognition. And it's so simple. There's just a view modifier on view called dot gesture. And you just pass a gesture. This argument that you pass a gesture just has to be anything that implements the gesture protocol. And we're going to talk about what things implement the gesture protocol. And that's it. 
And then after that, you're my view right there. Whenever that gesture starts to happen in your view, you're going to be asked to handle it. Now, how do we create this gesture? How do we specify what gesture we want here? We almost always do that with either a funk in our view, or maybe it's a computed var, or it even could be a local var at the top of our body var, right, before we do it. Anywhere you can store this thing is fine. And this computed var or funk or whatever just has to return something that is some gesture. So you know what some means? It means you can return anything you want in there as long as it implements that protocol, and Swift will figure out that return type for you. So right here I have var the gesture, and I'm returning tap gesture count of two. Swift will know that some gesture there is tap gesture. This tap gesture is one of the gestures that's built into Swift UI. You know it well, tap gesture. This particular one here I've made with a count of two. So this is actually a double tap. Tap gesture has an argument to its initializer, which is how many taps. And by default is one, but here I've said two. With the combination of two things of code you see on here, the one at the top and the one at the bottom, Swift will start recognizing a double tap but it won't do anything when the double tap, tap happens because we haven't told Swift how to handle a double tap happening. So the next step we need to do is to explain to it how to handle. And it depends on the kind of gestures how to do this. So some gestures are discrete, like tap gesture and long press gesture can be discrete, where it just, the tap happens and then go do something. A long press gesture happens and then go do something. That's different than a pinch or a drag, which kind of they're happening over time. We might wanna get involved in that. So for discrete gestures, those are easy. Let's get those out of the way. You do something by calling the function on your gesture on ended, which takes a closure. And in that closure, you do whatever you want when that tap gesture ends which means when the finger comes back up for a tap, or if it's a double tap, the second time the finger comes back up. And that's it. Couldn't be easier to handle a discrete gesture. And of course, the discrete gestures are so simple and easy to handle that they have these nice convenience functions. You've seen it on tap gesture. I didn't know if you know that it takes the argument count too. It does. And then you just do something. So that's exactly the same thing as what we've seen in the previous two slides here. We're just going to handle a tap gesture. So discrete gestures, easy. Non-discrete gestures, little more uh, work. In a non-discrete gesture, you do get the handle when it ends, which we'll talk about in a second, just like a discrete gesture, but you can also handle as it's moving, as the fingers are pinching together, or as they're rotating around, or as the finger is dragging itself around, the screen, you get to go do something, redraw your view a whole bunch of times as it moves around. Whatever you want to do, you get to do it. Now, examples of these non-discrete gestures, drag gesture, magnification gesture, that's like a pinch. Rotation gesture, that's kind of like you're turning a dial with two fingers. You put two fingers on the screen, it's like turning a dial and you're specifying some angle actually that changes as you do that. And even long press gesture can kind of be non-discrete where it's, you press and hold, and so it's going to say that the finger is holding, and then when it comes back up, you'll find out it came up. And that's different from a tap. You don't find out when the tap goes down. You only find when it goes up. But a long press, you can find out. So let's start by talking about the end of them. So just like discrete, we can find out the end, and it's exactly the same, dot on ended. The only difference is the function that you pass, the closure, gets an argument. Because when a drag gesture ends, you want to find out, well, what happened during that drag? And so you're going to get a little argument here, this value argument, and it's different for every kind of gesture. And that is going to tell you what happened. For a drag gesture, the value is a struck with things like the starting position of the drag and the ending position of the finger. For magnification, it's the scale of the magnification, which is how far the fingers are apart when they lift it up off the screen. And the rotation gesture, similar, right? It's like turning a dial. So it's gonna say, how much angle did it turn before the fingers lifted up? Still get to end it, but you get to find out, of course, what happens there. But the more interesting thing is during a non-discrete gesture, you wanna find out as things are changing. We do this by having some state that is only going to be in effect while the gesture is going on. And this state is stored in any var you want. You just have to mark it with this special marker at sign gesture state. 
And you must also give this bar an initial value of some sort. This bar can be any type you want. It could be a CG float. It could be a struct with all kinds of your own stuff in it. There's no limit on what this bar can be. And what this bar is basically going to do is tell your view, here's all the things you need to know to draw yourself in the middle of this gesture. That's what's going on here. That's what this bar is all about. But it is marked specially, and we're going to talk about what's special about it. The first thing to understand that's special about this var is that it's always going to return to that starting value when the gesture ends. That's why you must give it a starting value. So while the gesture is going on, you're going to be updating this gesture state of yours to reflect what's going on in the gesture every time the fingers move. But as soon as the fingers go up and it ends, this is going to get reset back to the starting value. So you have to understand that this gesture state is only the state while the gesture is active. Very important to understand. That's why I put this in red. When the gesture ends, it goes back to the starting value. Now, while the gesture is happening, you are given the opportunity, of course, to change this state. It's your own state, your own type, so you're the one who has to change it. And here's how you do that. Just like you had on ended, you have another function on your drag gesture called updating. Now, there's a lot of colors on the screen here, so let's go through all these different colors we have. The updating function takes two arguments, and the first one in parentheses there is your gesture state var. So you're going to pass your gesture state var to updating. Notice that you have to put a dollar in the front of it. I'll talk a little bit about that in the demo, why that, why that is, but really we're not going to talk about this until next week. But just always put a dollar in front of your gesture state var. Just like on ended, updating takes a closure that it's going to call. Now, it's going to call that thing repeatedly as the fingers are moving closer together or the fingers dragging across the screen or whatever. It's going to be calling this closure over and over and over. So what are the three arguments we have there to the closure? The first one, that blue value argument, that's the same thing as on ended. That is the state of this gesture, how close the fingers are together for pinching, how far the finger has moved if we're dragging, whatever. It's a struct. It depends on which gesture we're talking about here as to what's in there. Might not be a struct. Like magnification, I think it's just a CG float with the scale. But for drag gesture, it's a struct with start location, end location, time stamps, other things in there. So that's what that value is. You're used to that same as on ended. The my gesture state purple argument there is essentially your gesture state again. And not only is it there, it's also inside this little closure, and you can assign it a value in there. So I'm going to talk in the demo briefly about what's going on here. That's essentially an in-out parameter. But all you really need to know for the purposes of making this work is that your gesture state variable appears in these three places as the argument to updating, as the second argument to the closure, and then inside as a changeable, writable var that you can change. Now, if you want to just put your hands over your eyes and not think about it, you can just think that inside this closure, you can change your gesture state var. That's not actually what's happening, but it feels like it. But the conceptual semantic thing that's going on here, in fact, is that this is the only way you're supposed to change your gesture state. You cannot change your my gesture state any other place except for right inside this closure. And that makes sense because this gesture state is only supposed to be active when the gesture is going on. So you would never want to set it at any other time. There's absolutely no reason to set it any other time than while this thing is going on because that's all the gesture state is. Very important to understand. This is the only place you change your gesture straight bar. And you can change it to anything you want. And you're almost always going to change it to something based on what that blue value is, right? Depending on how close the fingers are together or how much they've moved, you're going to update your little gesture state struct so that your view draws itself properly in the middle of a drag or a pinch. Now, the third argument there, transaction, has to do with animation. We're not going to talk about that in this course. There are some limits. We just don't have time to talk about everything. Uh, you can look in the documentation if you want to try and figure out transaction. It's kind of for advanced animation interactions between views. We just have to draw the line somewhere. Now, there is actually a simpler version of dot updating. It's called dot on changed. And when you first see this, you might be like, oh, this is simpler. I'm going to use this. But it's only for certain kinds of changes. And I'll explain that in a second. 
So on changed looks just like updating, except for there's not that gesture state because in the on changed, you don't get to update any gesture state. This value is passed to you and you just have to do something based on it. And that's why it's quite limited to do this, but there are some kinds of things that you can do. And what are those things? Well, if you are doing something where you're actually interested in the actual finger positions, like you're doing drag to select, right? You're dragging your finger across the screen to select objects or something like that. Then you just want to know where that drag out is right now. You, that's different than if uh, you're pinching to scale something up or down or moving something around or whatever relative to where it was before. It's like absolute finger position or you're going to follow the finger around and draw like a pen in your app or something. Then you might want this. But most of the time you're interested in the relative change, how much you've pinched down, how far you've dragged across screen. And when you're interested in relative changes, that's when you need dot updating. All right, so I'm gonna summarize all the things I just said here in one slide. So this is a chance for you to review, and get it all at once, right? So here's how we handle non-discrete gestures when the fingers are moving. First, we're gonna collect any information that we need to draw our view while the gesture is happening into a gesture shape bar. Might only just be a CG float, might be a whole struct. Then we're gonna add dot updating to our gesture, whatever our pinch or drag is. And inside the dot updating closure that we passed, we're gonna get the value of what's going on with the gesture repeatedly. It's gonna constantly call us with the latest value of what's going on. We are going to update our gesture state, but we're going to understand that that gesture state, when the thing ends, is going to go away and be go back to its starting value. So in our ended of a non-discrete gesture, we're going to be sure to update whatever we need to do so that when that thing goes back to its starting value, our view still draws properly. All right, so let's hop into the demo. I'm going to show you that codable thing I talked about. We're going to use user defaults to store our document because I didn't have time so far to teach you about the file system and all that. There's quite a bit involved there, so we're not gonna, we'll do that later. I'm gonna do some other cool stuff, animating fonts, but mostly what we're gonna do today is do some gestures in our emoji art, make it so we can make our document bigger and smaller and pan around in it, that kind of stuff. All right, let's continue to improve our emoji art. And it has a big problem currently. For example, if I start building a really beautiful emoji art, some apples at the base of our tree. And then I quit my app. Well, when I come back, I've lost all the work that I've done. So that's not good. Next week or the week after, we'll actually work on having multiple documents and a document chooser and all that. But today, let's just try and work on making our document persist. When we make something persist, what do we need? kind of need two things. One, we need some sort of file format to store it in, and then we need a place to put it. Probably the place we're going to want to put it is in the file system, and I'm hoping to get around to showing you that in a couple of weeks. But in the meantime, we're just going to put it in user defaults, which we talked about in the slides today. Now, user defaults are totally the wrong place to put a document but it's a really easy one line of code, bam, it's in the user defaults. And really what we're focused on here is not where we're storing it, but more what file format are we gonna use and how do we generate that file format? And the file format we're gonna use is JSON. So most of you probably have heard of JSON before. It's a file format that's used mostly to pass things around on the internet. It's kind of a public file format and iOS has awesome feature built in where it will generate JSON from almost any struct that you can imagine. So we have our emoji art document as a struct in our model, and we can use this cool iOS feature to generate a JSON version of it. So let's do that. Let's hop back in here, go to our model. Here's our model, and we just want to turn this whole thing here into a blob of JSON. So how do we do that? I'm going to have a var called JSON. It's gonna return a data. Now this data is just a bag of bits. In our case, it's going to have JSON in there. So I'm just gonna return trying to use a JSON encoder to encode 
myself. This is the only line of code we really need to generate a JSON version of ourselves. But you can see we have an error here. It says instance method encode requires that emoji art conform to encodable. All right, so this is functional programming. Of course, there's a protocol involved encodable. So our emoji art has essentially encodable has to be something it conforms to. And amazingly, because of extensions, again, that are in Swift, usually you could just put encodable on a struct and it'll just work. But this one doesn't quite work. And it's going to work or not, depending on whether each var that's in your struct is itself encodable. So let's look at our vars. We got the background URL. URL, definitely that's encodable. I can guarantee you that. Emojis, what type is it? It's an array. Arrays, definitely encodable. But what's in the array? Emoji. Oh, that's this struct. Uh, okay, this struct is not encodable. No problem. We'll just say encodable. And again, using the same mechanism, Swift has automatically made it encodable. And now everything in my emoji R is encodable. So it's encodable and everything in this emoji struct is also encodable. Strings, ints, those are encodable. So this is encodable. Now we almost never make a struct encodable without also being decodable. It's no use turning something into a JSON if you can't turn it back into one of these things. And we'll make both of these decodable, of course. It's so common, in fact, to have both encodable and decodable that there's another protocol that inherits both of them, which is codable. So this is the protocol we're going to specify when we want to make something be turnable into JSON. So nothing more is required than making that codable. If you have a struct that doesn't have kind of standard types like this or substructs that can be marked codable. Codable is a protocol. It's got functions in there that you can use to turn anything into an encoded thing that can be JSONized. But most of the time we try to use simple types that we can do it on. So I'm not going to, it's not really within the realm. We're only in week four of this class and not really in our uh, knowledge base yet to go off and make something codable that doesn't use standard types, but you know where to start. You can go look at this protocol, see what the description of it is, and if you ever needed to, you could make your own structs codable, even if they weren't using these standard types. All right, so now that we have the JSON, I want to look at this. I want to see this JSON. So what I'm going to do actually is go back to my document, and every time I change my emoji art, I'm going to print out on the console a JSON representation of it. When I say every time this changes, some of you are thinking, oh, yeah, we know how to do that. Did set, right? This is a property observer. This is going to get called every time emoji art gets changed. Unfortunately, there's a bug in Swift right now. And if you're watching this after the Stanford quarter is over, it's quite possible that this bug has been fixed in Swift. But during the Stanford quarter, it's not yet fixed. And the problem is that property wrappers, which is what this at sign published is, and at sign state is also a property wrapper, et cetera, these don't play well currently with property observers. And that's like, I kind of think, believe it's a known problem that's going to get fixed soon, at least I hope. But it keeps us from doing this nice thing where in here we could just say print the JSON version of my emoji art equals, and here I'll just say emoji art.json. And this JSON is a data, of course, an optional data, and I want to turn it into a UTF 8 string. So UTF 8 is a string encoding that JSON always uses. And since this might be nil, if it's nil, then return the string nil. This UTF-8 bar is something that I added to data in the emoji art extension, so you can check that out. So it would be nice if we could just have this print out every time this changes. Since these two aren't compatible, what we're going to do is stop having this be at sign published. So we're going to take that out of there. I'm even going to mark here that this is a workaround for property 
observer problem with property wrappers. And instead, we still need this emoji art when it's going to change to do the observable object thing. And this is a good reminder of what that's doing. And I'm going to do it in my will set. Object will change dot send. That's what this observable object thing is doing when we're published. It's publishing this something changed message. So we mentioned that way back when, when we first talked about observable objects, but just as a reminder. So I'm doing that myself. Now, this is not quite as good as having this being published. And we really haven't learned enough about assign publish and what it's doing to understand why this is not quite as good. It's going to work for our purposes just fine. But at time published actually is providing something called a publisher for this thing changing. And we can use that. In fact, we if we knew more about published at this point in the quarter, we could use it to do this workaround in a different way that would probably be a little better. But this is fine. This makes it work for us. We're still going to have our observable object notice changes. And we're going to print out JSON every time our emoji art changes. Let's take a look, see if that worked. And I'm going to drag something. Now, as soon as I drop this, I believe my emoji art should change and I should see JSON. Ready? Boom. Woohoo, we did. Let's, in fact, let's make this smaller. We can see it going at the same time. There's our JSON down here. It's got the background image. And see the emojis? No emojis because I haven't put any emojis in. Let's go ahead and put an emoji in. Maybe an apple below the tree again. There's an apple. How about maybe planet Earth up in the sky up there on Mars or something here? And you can see that it is generating JSON that represents our whole document. So that was super easy to be able to generate JSON like that. And now we're going to do another super easy thing is we're going to throw that JSON into user defaults as a way of making our document permanent. Now, again, we don't have multiple documents yet. We can't name documents. We really should be putting them in the file system or even in iCloud or something like that. But for now, let's just make it persist so that when we quit and then when we go back, we don't lose our beautiful images. Now we're going to do that. So I'm going to stop printing here. I'm just going to say user default dot standard. That's the standard users defaults user defaults database. You can have others, but that's the standard one. We use that 99% of the time. Set this emoji art JSON value for a certain key. And you'll remember that from the slides that user defaults is like a dictionary, feels like a dictionary. And I just have to specify a key. I'll say emoji art document dot, this is like an untitled document or something. This key can be anything. We tend to put something like the class name or the struct name at the beginning of it, just because this user default standard is used for a whole app. We might have other structs that want to be storing things in user defaults, and we don't want their keys to collide with ours. And that's it. That's going to write this thing in there. Notice this is a data, and it knows that this user default knows how to put in datas and strings and dates and ints and floats. and you know, arrays of those things and dictionaries of those things, and that's it. It also knows how to handle an optional because this is an optional. If I say set and this is nil, it'll just clear out anything for this key. Now we want to get it out. How do we get that thing out? Well, back here in emoji art, we know how to encode ourselves as a JSON, but we need some code over here to decode ourselves. And I'm going to do that with an init. I'm going to have an init that takes a JSON data as an argument and tries to look at this data and decode it to be an emoji art. So how would we do that? I'm just going to say if this JSON data does not equal nil, I obviously can't decode nil, then I'm going to let a new emoji art that I'm going to create equal trying to use a JSON decoder to decode an emoji art. And here I'm specifying the type of thing I want to decode. And when we specify type, remember we put dot self, like URL dot self we did for the drop last time. And I'm going to do this from the JSON that was passed in. And this is either work, going to work or not. It also has a try, just like this had a try. 
and the data of contents of had a try. If this fails, it's going to return nil. So this if let is just going to do nothing. We won't get in here. But if this doesn't fail, now I have a new emoji art. So now I kind of want to replace my whole self with this new emoji art because I'm initializing myself. And believe it or not, for a value type, you can say self equals something. It is, you are allowed with a value type to assign something to self, and it will replace the whole thing. You can do it with the enums too. And that's great. That's exactly what I want. I'm initializing. I'm just going to set myself equal to whatever emoji art I was able to decode from the JSON that you gave me. But what if I can't decode it though? Right? If I don't do anything here, I'm going to get a blank emoji art document because I won't have initialized any of these to something different than their defaults, which this one's nil, and this is an empty array. So I'd get a blank emoji art document. But I don't think that's what I want here. If someone asked me to create an emoji art document with this JSON and I'm unable to do it for some reason, I really kind of need to let them know. And the way I'm going to do that is with a failable initializer. If you put question mark right after init, then when people call this initializer, if this initializer returns nil, then they'll get nil back as the object they were trying to create. And that really is going to send the message, I tried to create an emoji art with this JSON, but I couldn't. So failable initializer, real easy. You just put question mark, return nil whenever you fail. And then when people are creating you, they have to check for nil because you're returning essentially an optional version of emoji art here. Now we added an init here, and I don't know if you remember the rules, but if you add an init, then you lose your free init. The free init that you know specifies each argument these are all have defaults so you could say init with no arguments which is what we do over here actually we create an emoji art empty with no arguments we lost that init so we have to add it back so an init with no arguments does nothing in our structs it just takes these default values and uses them so now we have a way of creating an emoji art document from this JSON data. So let's use that over here. Instead of doing this, where we create an empty one, I'm going to have an init for my document. And in my init, I'm just going to set my emoji art equal to the emoji art that I get from passing the JSON that I get out of user defaults. So I'm going to use my standard user defaults. This time I'm going to ask for a data for that same key. Now I could just copy and paste this down to here but that's a dangerous move if i miss a character or whatever then these won't match so let's be good programmers and instead create a little static var i'm going to call it untitled let's pick it private static let untitled equals that string and then i'll use that down here emoji art document dot untitled this way I'm guaranteed that whatever I'm saving out is the same key I'm using to get it back in. By the way, once we load this emoji art back up, we're for sure going to want to fetch our background image because the emoji art document doesn't store the image, just the URL. So we got to go back out into the internet and get the image data when we load it up. Now we're still having an error here, value of optional type emoji art, emoji art optional must be unwrapped to type emoji art. And that makes sense, right? Because this is a failable initializer. It could return nil. Emoji art up here can't take nil. It's not an optional emoji art. So what I'm going to do here is if it returns nil, I'm going to create a blank document. So at least we'll have some document. OK, let's fire this thing up, see if it works. OK, we start out with a blank document. Of course, that's this question mark, question mark, blank document because we couldn't load anything up from user defaults at the start. There was nothing in there. But if we start building our thing here, let's do that. Put our apples back in here. Put our earth up in the sky up here. This is hopefully writing out the JSON as we speak to our user defaults. Let's, let's quit and then run it again and see what happens. Woohoo! There's a document. Now, sometimes you have to be a little careful. If we, I don't know, drop a baseball in the front yard, there it is, and now we press stop. 
And then we run again. Oh, we lost our baseball. Why didn't the baseball work? Well, user default, when you put things in user default, it doesn't run right out to the disk and write it out. It kind of buffers them up and writes them out at an appropriate time when it's convenient. And we don't give it a chance to do that because we pick this baseball up, we put it down here and we hit stop and that kills our app. It just kills it. There's no chance to go do something like that. So when you're doing debugging and you're using, we got lucky that time it wrote it out. When you're doing that, one thing you want to do is when you have a change and you want user defaults to write, write things out, just switch to another app. Here I'm going to switch to the files app. Doesn't really matter. And switch back because when you switch to another app, user defaults is always going to write the database out. And that way when you quit and you come back, it's there. That's all I really wanted to talk about in terms of storage for now. And we're going to be working on this more as the quarter goes on. But the next thing I want to talk about is gestures. And what I want to be able to do here is to zoom in and out on my document. And I'll show you why. Here's another image down here. Let's go ahead and drag and drop this image in here and see what happens. Whoa. Okay, it definitely put that image in here, but it's huge. This is just a huge image. And so I really want to be able to zoom in here. Okay, I'm holding down option, by the way, in the simulator. That's how you can simulate two fingers being down. And I really want to zoom in and see the whole picture here. Okay, there's another horse, a whole bunch of other animals. I want to be able to see these things. Now, I don't know if you know, there's another terrible problem with this huge image. It blasted. Our emoji palette, we can't even add more emojis. They all got wiped out up here. This is somehow drawing outside of where it's supposed to draw. And that's actually normal in Swift UI. The default in Swift UI is for views to be able to draw outside of their boundaries. So if we want to keep a view inside its boundaries, we have to do a modifier on it. So let's start with that. Let's get our palette back before we do anything. The modifier we use, Really, really simple. So we're going to put it, uh, let's put it on the Z stack right here. So here's our Z stack of stuff. It's called dot clipped. Dot clip just means all the drawing it does is going to be clipped to the bounds of the view. By the way, while I'm here, let's move this stuff, the edges stuff and the dropping stuff. Let's move that down here as well. The reason I'm moving that out here is these do semantically apply to the Z stack. We do want the Z stack going all the way to the edges, and we want to be able to drop anywhere in the Z stack. And it cleans up this in here, so it's much cleaner of what's going on in here. Although um, this is not very clean right here. Let's go back. Let's go make sure this clipped work. Then we're going to run back in here and fix this not so clean code right there. All right, here's our big thing. And it's still big, so we still need our gesture. But look, woo, we still have our various emoji, and we can still drop them in there. All right, let's go back and clean that code I was talking about. This code, why is this not really clean? In Swift UI, it's all really about breaking these views down into small little views, especially when you have a semantic boundary of a view like we have here. What is this code all about? This code is all just about showing this background image, but unfortunately it might be nil. So we have to check for that. That's all we're doing here. And this is, if someone's reading through our code, they're having to parse a lot of code here just to realize that we're showing an image that might be optional. We shouldn't ask readers of our code to have this much you know, trouble understanding what's going on. I'm going to make another sub view, and this is the way we break this down. We just make uh, either call functions and vars to put our views somewhere else, or we can make new views, like we made card view. So I'm going to make another view down here. I'm going to struct. I'm going to call it optional image, and it's just going to be a view that takes a var, which is a UI image, optional UI image, and then my var body. I'm going to return some view as always. I'm just going to put this code up in there. So I'm going to go grab this code. Let's get this out of here. Cut this down in here. Paste. 
And of course, I'm using this UI image instead of this background image. That's it. So I've just created this little utility thing right here. And all it does is handle a UI image that might be nil. And now my code up here turns from all that mess to just optional image of the self dot document dot background image. Much cleaner up here to understand what's going on, especially looking at this Z stack right here. It's clear that this is my background image and these are my emojis, much simpler. Now this optional image, this has nothing to do with emoji art whatsoever. So I'm gonna take it out of here and put it in its own file, which really wanna do that when you have something that's unrelated, don't bury those things inside unrelated code. So this is called optional image, put it in its own file. And this file that I've created right here, well, I might well use this, drip, pick it up and drag it into some other app that I'm writing. It's quite a useful little view here and quite reusable in that sense. I wanted to take that little detour just because I didn't want you to be creating these views that just had hundreds of lines of code in here and then just completely ununderstandable. Okay, back to what we want to do, which is we want to be able to, in our emoji art over here, zoom in on these huge images so we can see what's going on there. We're going to do that by introducing a new piece of state into our view, which I'm going to call our zoom scale. This is just at sign state because it's only going to affect the way our view looks. This has nothing to do with our emoji or document itself. It's purely a UI visual thing and it's temporary. As we zoom in and out, it's just kind of showing us how much zooming there is. This is going to be a CG float. I'm going to start it out equal 1.0. And this zoom scale is going to be how much we're zoomed in or out on our entire document. Zoom scale 1.0 means our document is whatever the size of its background view URL image is. But 2.0 means it's twice as big as that. And 0.5 means it's half as big as that. The first thing I'm going to do with this zoom scale is go apply it to everywhere in my view where it would matter. So for example, my background image. Clearly that matters. I want to scale effect it to be our zoom scale. So that's going to make my background image the right size. Of course, my emojis here also need to get bigger when I zoom in. So that's their font. So let's go down to their font. Here it is. We're setting their font to this font size. We've got to zoom that up by our zoom scale. And the other thing we need to do is every time we're converting, from this iOS coordinate system, which is 0, 0 in the upper left, to the emoji art coordinate system, which is 0, 0 in the middle, we have to be careful because when things are far away from the middle, when they're zoomed up, they're very far from the middle. So it affects that. So where are the two places that we convert those coordinate systems? One is here when we're dropping, and also here where we're positioning the emojis. This is place where we're going through the emojis and putting them down, well, obviously we're being told where they are in emoji arts zero zero centered coordinate system. We need to convert them. So we need to fix both of these cases. Our location of the drop is now just going to be the location it was, but divided by the zoom scale. Same thing with Y. So that fixes the coordinate system transformation for drops. And for position, mm, kind of have this embedded here. Let's clean this up a little bit. I'm going to say my location is my emojis location. And I'm going to modify the location to be this essentially, except for that now I put it in location. I'm going to return that location. And by splitting that out, it makes it really easy for us to add this little zoom scale modification to it right before. So I'm going to say location equals CG point location dot X times our zoom scale. And the Y is location dot Y times our zoom scale. That seems to be all the places I think that our zoom scale would apply. We're zooming our document in nicely. 
how, what gesture are we gonna use? Well, we wanna use pinch, but I'm gonna have another gesture that's kind of fun, which is double tap. And double tap is going to zoom my entire document to exactly fit the space available, right? We get a certain amount of space for our document, depending on the, what our, where our app is in the UI, and I'm gonna zoom it to fit that. So let's create a new private func here that I'm gonna call zoom to fit. And it's gonna take the image to have it fit, which might be nil, because our background image can be nil, in some size. And it's just going to set our zoom scale. So it's gonna set this zoom scale to fit. Now I'm only gonna do this if we have an image. If we have an image, I'm not gonna to touch the zoom scale. And I'm also only gonna do this if that image has some size. So I'm gonna to check to make sure that the image size.width is greater than zero and that the image size.height is greater than zero. So we have some image of some size and now we're going to zoom to fit it. Now we could zoom it based on the horizontal zoom by saying size.width divided by images size.width. Or we could do it by the vertical zooming, which would be the size that height divided by the image that size dot height. So which of these two should we use, the horizontal or the vertical? Well, I think we're gonna use the smaller of the two. So I'm gonna set my zoom scale equal to the min of the horizontal zoom or the vertical zoom. So whichever is gonna make it smaller. That way the image will always be fully on screen no matter what. Almost there. Now we just need to add the gesture to our views. We just mark whichever views we want that double tap to work on to be able to do this. So I'm gonna make it so that double tapping on the background here does that. So let's go here and add a gesture. We do that with the gesture view modifier and we just specify the gesture we want. Now I'm going to make a little function to make that gesture called double tap to zoom in geometry.size. And this function has to return something that is some gesture. This gesture takes only takes a gesture as its argument. So I'm gonna go down here and create a private func called double tap to zoom in size. And it has to return some gesture. That's what this view modifier takes, it takes some gesture. So we have to return some gesture. What gesture are we going to return? Well, we're doing double tap. So that is a tap gesture. There are a number of gestures. We talked about this in the slides. Tap gesture is a good one for doing double tap. In fact, I want a tap, tap gesture whose count is two. And I'm going to return that. But of course, I have to specify when this tap gesture happens, what am I going to do? In this case, I want to call zoom to fit. And we do that by the onEnded function in gesture. Now, onEnded takes a function to execute when this gesture, whatever it is, in this case, a double tap, ends. So where double tap is when that second tap finger comes up, it ended, and we can do onEnded here. What are we going to do in here? Self dot zoom to fit. And what are we going to fit? We're going to fit our document's background image. And the size is the size that was passed in. So let's take a look. Here's our huge image. I'm going to double tap. Woo! We made it small. Let's go for the smaller image, this little guy. It's a really small image because we're zoomed in right now. Whoop. Now, the only thing I don't really like about what I've done here is it's kind of jarring. And we know that in mobile apps, we want things not to jump like that. We want some animation. So let's throw some animation in here. You know how to do that with animation, explicit animation. Put the zoom to fit in there. Let's see how that works. Woo, that looks a lot, lot better. But I actually think I noticed something weird with the emojis there. So let's go get the small one here and watch these emojis. Ooh, they're kind of 
jerky. Uh, you know, anytime I see an animation, I don't really like what I'm seeing. I'm going to go over here and slow it way down. So let's use a linear animation here. Duration, let's say four seconds. Let's just watch that thing in action. All right, let's pick up the bigger one again. Here it is. All right, now I'm going to double tap, and we're going to watch these emoji. Oh, whoa. So the, the emoji aren't animating. They just jumped to the size they should be. And actually, I think it's even worse than that. Let's go ahead and watch them now going bigger. Ready, ready, watch here. Oh, see that? They went big, and then they kind of got cut off because the size of the view was animating, but it hadn't caught up to how big they are. So uh, this is a problem. We have to somehow animate the size of this font that's being used. Well, we know how to do this. So this is a little bit of review for you, actually. How does animation work in SwiftUI? It happens with view modifiers. Now, I'm not going to go through, take, we're already pressed for time in this demo, so I'm not going to go through all the details of making our own animatable font size view modifier, but I did do it. So let's go over here and drag it in. Here is my animatable modifier. I'm going to take a brief look at this code. You can look at it at your leisure later. But all it's doing is essentially making animatable data that is the font size. So I have this font size, it's the animatable data, and my content is just a font, the system font of that size. Couldn't be easier. I've even made a nice little extension on view that lets me be able to say dot font animatable with size and give it the size and it will automatically modify it. This is really easy to apply this wherever we set the font, which is right here, instead of calling this self set font for emoji, which is down here, I'm just going to take this size, cut it out of there, and I'm not going to need this anymore, and put it right up in here in my new font, animatable size. There it is. That's the size I want. And we need to. This is going to modify this text in an animatable way to this new font size. All right, again, you can double tap here. Okay, it's so slow. It looks like it's working there. Let's make the really big one over here. Okay, watch them carefully now. Here we go. Ooh, yeah, looking good. Much smoother animation there. And the real test, try the smaller one. Ooh. Okay, so it looks like our animation is working perfectly here. Let's go ahead and speed it back up and move on to doing our pinch. So the pinch is just a different kind of gesture. And you'll remember from the slides that we did today that the way these non-discrete gestures work, like drags and pinches, is that while the gesture is active, we are going to modify some state. And that state is going to affect the way things look while we're doing the pinch or the drag. And then when the drag ends, whatever the end state is, we are going to update our steady state value for whatever modifying our view. And it stays in that state. The key to understanding how these gestures work, these non-discrete gestures is, that you're gonna have two different pieces of state. So we're gonna have our state, which is our zoom scale normally. I'm gonna rename that to steady state zoom scale. So that's this is gonna be the zoom scale that we have just in steady state, not while a gesture is going on. And then we're gonna have a new piece of state, which is going to be gesture state, which is different than state, slightly different. And it's going to be the gesture zoom scale. So this is going to be the zoom scale we're going to use while the gesture is going on. Now, it's important to know that this gesture state could be of any type. It doesn't actually even have to be the same kind of thing that your steady state one is doing. This just has to be whatever information is going to change every time the pinch moves or a drag moves or whatever that you, lets you keep track of it. Now, in our case, when we're pinching, we do just want to keep track of whatever the scale is. 
So that makes it so that our zoom scale that we had before, we're still gonna have that, and it's gonna be computed by just returning the steady state zoom scale times the gestures zoom scale. Now this gesture zoom scale is 1.0. So when a gesture is not going on, it's just, this is gonna be equal, right? Steady state zoom scale times 1.0 is gonna be the same as steady state zoom scale. But when our gesture is working and a pinch moves out a little bit, it starts to be greater than one and our zoom scale is gonna go up. And when this pinch comes back in, it's gonna go back lower. So our job is to make a gesture, a pinching gesture, that modifies this gesture zoom scale only while we are pinching. And then right at the end of the gesture, it's going to update this to our steady state value. That's how we do gestures. Now, notice down here we're getting error. That's because we're zooming to fit. We obviously are trying to zoom to fit our steady state zoom scale. We make a gesture for pinching exactly the same way as we do this gesture for double tap to zoom. We're just going to have dot gesture, and we're going to have a different function. I'm going to call this my zoom gesture. And my zoom gesture actually doesn't need the size. It's not like double tap where it needs the size. So I have this zoom gesture. By the way, this could be a var. This doesn't have to be a func since it doesn't take any arguments. But let's go ahead and put our zoom gesture down here. Let's put it right in here. Private func zoom gesture. And it's also going to return some gesture because we're passing it to this gesture function here, it has to do some zoom gesture. Also, by the way, I think I'm gonna put my zoom gesture on the whole document. So I'm just gonna put this down here on the whole document, not just on our background. I don't think there's a difference because our background fills, is fills our entire document. But again, kind of more just for code clarity, I'm going to kind of separate these things out. This zoom gesture returns some gesture. What kind of gesture? It's going to return what's called a magnification gesture. That's how we do a pinch. So it's going to return it. And in fact, it's the same as the double tap in that it has an on ended. The only difference with the on ended of a magnification gesture is that it gives you as an argument the final gesture scale. So this is the gesture scale that was at the end when the user's fingers went up from the pinch. With this final gesture scale, I can just reset my steady state zoom scale to times equals my final gesture scale. So if the gesture went to twice as big and the fingers went up, now my, in my steady state, I'm going to be twice as big. And same thing if it went down to half as big. So that's it. So the on ended, just like the on ended down here with double tap, was easy to implement. The trick or the key part of doing these non-discrete gestures is while it's changing. So here's what that looks like. It's called dot updating. And dot updating takes an argument, which is your whatever your gesture state is for this gesture. So we'll say gesture zoom scale. However, you have to put a dollar sign in front. And we're gonna talk about what this dollar sign means next week. It turns this into what's called a binding, so that it's bound to this other bar. But you really don't need to know that to make this gesture stuff work. Understand it's just essentially linking up to your gesture state. And of course, this takes an argument as well, which is a function. This function is called every time the pinch gesture changes. So this is constantly being called. This little function is constantly being called as the pinch moves in and out. And this thing has three arguments. The first one, very easy to understand. It's the latest gesture scale. That's just telling you what the latest pinch looked like. This second argument is really weird. It's our gesture state as an in-out parameter. We'll talk about that in a second. And the last, our last argument here is a transaction. I'm not gonna talk about transactions. Transactions are essentially capturing the animation environment that this is all happening in. We, that's a little bit of advanced use for animation that we're gonna pretty much ignore in this class. So we're gonna ignore this argument as well. But we are gonna focus on this gesture state in out. So an in out parameter, hopefully you got this from your reading assignment last week. 
but it takes an argument in normally. So when someone calls this function, the argument comes in normally. But then if you actually assign a value to this, then it gets copied back out on the way out. So this gesture is essentially passing you your own gesture state bar in, letting you modify it in here. And then when you pass it out, it turns it up here and changes it. So why is that happening? Why are we not just changing our gesture zoom scale directly in here? Why am I not saying gesture zoom scale equals something? Why do I do it through this variable? Well, the answer for that is that this gesture state var, while it's in your view, is really owned by this gesture. Other than the initial value that you give it, you should never assign a value to this directly. Always let the gesture handle it. What does the gesture do with it, by the way? Well, when the gesture is not happening, it leaves it at 1.0. And then while the gesture is happening, it's passing it to you and you can modify it here. And then when it's over, it goes back to 1.0. So the gesture wants to own that var. And so you are not allowed to own it. This in out business, if you don't really understand what I'm saying about in out parameters, didn't understand the rating, maybe go back and do the rating. But even then, if you don't understand it, then just understand that the gesture here, this magnification gesture, only wants you to modify your gesture state inside this function that's called repeatedly as the pinch happens. Now, because that's what this is doing, a lot of people will rename this to be the exact same name as their gesture state variable. And when they do this, call it the exact same thing, now it kind of looks like you are changing this in here. I'm actually a fan of that. I don't say this at the beginning because I want you to understand what's happening here, but I think naming this the same is a good idea. So what do we want to do every time that pinch goes in and out or changes a little bit? Well, here we just want to grab the latest gesture scale. So whatever this is at the last time the pinch moved, we want to set that as our gesture zoom scale. So this is kind of like the simplest possible thing to do while updating. We're gonna do a little more complicated thing when we do the drag gesture and panning the thing around. So that's all that's required to support this zoom gesture, right? We created a zoom gesture, a magnification gesture. It updates our steady state when it ends. While it's going on, it updates this gesture state, which is transient. We only do it while the gesture is happening. And all we do is attach this zoom gesture to our Z stack so that when that gesture happens in our Z stack, we recognize it. All right, so here's our little document. We'll hold down Option to get the two fingers, and we can zoom in and zoom out. And we can still double tap to show the whole image. We could also go over here and get our huge background. And we can zoom in and out, double tap. We can do the same thing for panning around because if I'm zoomed way in here and I want to see this other horse, I'd like to be able to drag this over. For pan, I'm not going to go through all the detail of the code again, typing this all in because uh, it's very similar to doing the same thing we did here with the zoom gesture. But I am going to walk through the code with you. And for the pan, this is the code that I just added. We are going to still have steady state pan offset and still going to have the gesture pan, which is going to be only the pan while we're dragging. And then that'll make a pan offset by adding the two together and multiplying by zoom scale, of course. By the way, I am doing some things here like adding points together. Normally you can't do that in Swift, but I added some emoji art extensions down here for point and size to be able to make this code here look a lot simpler. So you can check those out if you want as well. This feels exactly the same, right? Pan offset feels like zoom scale. It's just taking the steady state and adding the gestures in, while in motion value. So let's look at pan gesture because it's slightly different than a magnification gesture. It's a drag gesture and on the ended, it's pretty much the same. We get our final drag value. The only thing about this is that the drag value that's passed to us is a little more complicated than it is for magnification. For magnification, it's just a simple scale. That is the value that's passed, both while we're updating and when it ends. 
but a drag has more information. So we're going to go and actually take a look at this in the documentation. Open it up. Here's drag gesture. And it's explaining a little bit of this up here. But down in here, you can see when we have the updating and on ended, this value that's being passed to us when we're handling things happening in the gesture is actually of type drag gesture dot value right here. So I'm going to click on this dot value and we're going to see what it looks like. And you can see that this value is not a simple float like the scale was in magnification gesture. It's actually a struct and it has the location of where you are currently with the finger and also the start location where you started from, even the time. So it's the time stamped every single time it updates so you can know how fast it's moving and things like that. And here's the translation, which is a CG size width and height, how far it's gone since the start of the pan and we're going to use this translation to update our offset so here it is right here we're going to say translation latest drag value translation and here and all we're going to do is take the translation we have to divide it by the zoom scale of course and we're going to add it in the end to our steady state and while it's updating it's going to be our gesture pan state and then we just add those two together off we go otherwise it's very very similar so now that we have this pan offset, we just need to use it everywhere that it makes sense to have a pan. So that's easy. It's a lot of the same places we did the zoom scale right here where we do the scale effect. Of course, we want to offset our view. Everyone remembers the offset. You probably use that a lot in homework three, maybe through animation, but here's the offset for the background image. How about the offset for the emoji? So that's here in this position thing. And the position, remember, is doing the coordinate system transformation from zero, zero in the center, and so is drop. So both of these are going to need to be adjusted, both position and this. So let's do this one first while we're here. Just gonna throw this right in here. Location equals a CG point. That is the X location, but minus the pan offsets width. And the Y is the location dot Y minus the pan offsets height. And then that position right here, let's go down and fix that. It's doing the same transition in the opposite direction, actually. It's right here. So it's a location equals a CG point, which is X x plus the pan offset dot width and the y is the location dot y plus the pan offset dot height so that's that and the only other thing i want to do with pan offset is when i double click to zoom to fit we want to i think reset it to the center so let's say steady our steady state pan offset equals dot zero which is the same as cg size dot zero by the way but swift can infer dot zero the cg size for us i think that's all we need to do those are the only places that the pan matters just moving the background around and then making sure we're doing the right coordinate system transfer on the positions of the emojis and just like we added the gesture for a zoom gesture let's add the gesture for our pan gesture and you can add multiple gestures here. If they might conflict with each other in some ways, then there are methods that you can find in gesture for doing gesture simultaneously or even exclusively where one gesture, once it wins, will not allow the other one. You can take a look at that in the gesture documentation. All right, let's see. Woo, there we go. We can do that. We can zoom way in look around and zoom out so we now nice combination of zooming and panning throughout our whole document now your homework assignment is going to be to do the same thing zooming and panning but with these little emoji in that case is moving the emojis around and also resizing the emojis so that they're larger compared to the background and that's really going to let us build real beautiful emoji art because we can actually control the sizing and positioning of things. So you're going to have to manage the selection of these things, selecting them. 
That homework, by the way, is next week. In your assignment A3, you don't have to, you're not using any gestures in your assignment A3. This is next week's homework I'm talking about. And as I mentioned earlier, the one data structure you might want to use to keep your selection is a set. So if you're going to put your little emojis into a set, they need to be hashable. So let's talk about how that works. Back here in emoji art, we have our emojis right here, and they're identifiable and they're codable, and you can also make them hashable. And if you mark it hashable, it means they can be put in a set. Note that you don't have to do anything, it just works. And that's because, again, the, the types in this struct are such that Swift can automatically do this hashability for you. So not only could you put this in a set, but emojis could also be the keys in a dictionary if you wanted. I don't think you're gonna need that for your homework, but I just wanted to show you that real quick in case you wanted to do that. So that's it for today. We added a lot of cool features to our emoji art and that we can save it. And when we leave and come back, we don't lose all that wonderful work that we did. And of course we have double tap and we can resize and pan. So there's a lot more things we could do to make our emoji art even better. And we'll dive into all of that next week. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.